ਬੁੱਲਿਆ ਆਸ਼ਿਕ ਕੋਲੇ ਰੱਬ ਦਾ ਮੁਲਾਮ ਤੁਹਾਰੀ ਲਾਖ ਲੋਕੀ ਕਾਫਰ ਕਾਫਰ ਆਖਦੇ ਤੂੰ ਆਹੋ ਆਹੋ ਆਖ ਵੋਕਿੰਗ ਸੀ ਆਰ ਸੇਸ ਵੈਨ ਟੋਕਿੰਗ ਦਾ ਦਿਸ ਕੋਸ਼ੀ ਬਾਬਾ ਬੁੱਲੇ ਸ਼ਾ ਐਂਡ ਕੋਚਾ ਬਲਾਮ ਫਰੀਦ ਆਮ ਰੀਅਲੀ ਡਿਲਾਈਟਿਡ ਟੂ ਵੈਲਕਮ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਕ੍ਰਿਸ ਫਸ਼ਾਕੋ ਐਂਡ ਜਸਟ ਅ ਲਿਟਲ ਬਿਟ ਆਫ ਬੈਕਗ੍ਰਾਉਂਡ ਔਨ ਔਨ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਜੀ ਐਸ ਅ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਜੀ ਸਟੱਡੀ ਪੈਜਨ ਇਨ ਟਰਕੀ ਸ਼ਾ ਆਕਸਫੋਰਡ ਐਂਡ ਇਸ ਐਂਡ ਨਾਓ ਰਿਟਾਇਰਡ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਆਫ ਮਾਡਰਨ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜਸ ਔਫ ਸਾਊਥ ਏਸ਼ੀਆ ਐਟ ਦ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਆਫ ਲੰਡਨ ਐਂਡ ਫਰਦਰਮੋਰ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਜੀ ਮੈਂ ਦ ਅਰਥੀ ਡਿਪਾਰਟਮੈਂਟ ਐਟ ਸਰਾਸ ਜਸਟ ਅਪ ਦਾ ਰੋਡ ਫਰਮ ਹੀਅਰ ਐਂਡ ਪ੍ਰੋਫੈਸਰ ਜੀ ਵਾਸ ਇਲੈਕਟਿਡ ਅ ਫੈਲੋ ਆਫ ਦ ਬ੍ਰਿਟਿਸ਼ ਅਕੈਡਮੀ ਇਨ 1990 he received the 2004 award of the royal asiatic society and was given pakistan's highest award for the arts as in 2005 his publications include the saraki language of central pakistan uh, a good amount of glossary uh, an introduction to the sacred language of the six uh, sufi lyrics which is a collection of bulish arts bahrian translated into english uh, and most recently professor ji's latest project was to translate these timeless poems of khwaja gulam free uh and the khwaja ji's teachings into english in this new book i was looking at the fact you get an early copy of this uh, and it really is a lovely work consisting of a, a translation of uh, 24 of uh, khwaja ji's lessons uh, and then a translation of around 50 poems set up alongside the saraki originals so professor you welcome uh thanks for being here uh, could we start so we've been asked to talk about i guess bullish our uh and khwaja gulam free to me that very different individuals uh different <coughs> not just in their writing so the language um but also i guess regionality but there are common threads that run through their poetry could we perhaps go into that a little you know the similarities or the differences let's let's start with similarities <laughs> right well like all the sufi poets you know that they're their inspired and their central inspiration comes from this powerful concept of the unity of of the the fact that the world is you know suffused with the divine and behind <coughs> all the apparent multiplicity there is an essential unity and um you can see why really it should have appealed so very much to in south asia with its incredible facts of you know variety and diversity and no wonder there was a longing for for a unity to just explain it all and so it comes from that and it really is the way in which they what fascinating to me <coughs> is the way in which these different sage poets you know each had their own take on it mm. and expressed it in different different ways mm. and i think that that um although i have some sympathy we were talking about this just before <coughs> with the um the common idea that it would be you hear it very often in Pakistan that they are all all the great sufi same poets you know were the same they're preaching the same message and giving the same stuff they were they were doing it actually very differently of course and i would one day if i'm spared you know perhaps you come back to write about that to try and explain my understanding of that i'm not sure really getting it so we were doing it today um because not least you know they're very different in bulishar and um kagafari you know very different in in place in circumstance <coughs> and in time of course so we know much more about kagafari because he was sorry yes of course does that matter yes thank Good. you um You know, he died in in 1901, so you know it's quite a lot recorded about his life, and that's you know in this book, you know, I've done a partial translation of his Malpas Art, um, which tells you something about him, as, as seen through the eyes of a of a disciple, and you know we didn't have anything comparable to Bulisha. Yeah. Um, he was also, you know. Ex- placed in an extraordinarily privileged position in society <coughs> that his you know his family were um, the peers of the the ruling really, um, amirs of Bahawalpur quite early. yes so um, in that way he um, you know he mingled in very kind of high society and was able to um, he had a wonderful you know education from that in the, in the princely household um 
and a very, you know, cultured and uh, sort of civilized person. Brunichard, we don't have that same, you know, he was less happily placed because I don't think, you know, Lahore in the, um, in, the, in the sort of early 18th century was such a comfortable place to live as Bahamapur in, in the princely state in, in the late 19th century. And the circumstances of time have been also meant that the, you know, the poems that we have, the very precious legacy of Willishar's poetry, is not, the edges of it are a bit rough. You know, we don't know really whether he wrote all the stuff. That, I mean, he's, we've certainly lost quite a bit too. Khashoggi, on the other hand, had his own, um, he was responsible really for editing his poetry. He did it, he collected it very carefully. He um, arranged it with great care. Um, it's sort of it's done like his copies are done like a, like an Urdu divan, you know, which the, the rhyme letter, the Ladif, organizes the. So you have all the Alif rhyme at the beginning, all the Ye ones at the end. But unlike. Does anyone who's tried to find poems in divans knows? It's not, you know, knowing the relief is one thing, but you then to actually find the poem, especially in the ones with a very, very common rhyme, it's quite difficult to find. Well, Khajavri had the answer to that, but he also indexed them by f the first letter of the first line. So it's a kind of double classification system. So it's quite remarkably, um, quite remarkably preserved in that way. And of course, um, much tended and loved by, um, you know, Sirachi devotees ever since the um, librarian produced the first edition in the parts in 1944, I think, the magnificent one that the Navarre paid for. So it's a beautiful text, the Jordu commentary and everything. So in that way, we have very different takes on the two. Mm. Our access to the two people is different. And the reference was very different as well, right? So you talked about quite the and the closeness to the state or principality of Bulishar very much comes across as someone who was rejected uh, by kind of mainstream uh, religious folk at the time. Could you talk to that a little bit and how that, that was a thread that ran through their writings? Well, it's of course um, all the way through the whole, you know, tradition of Persian Sufi poetry and um, Sufi is based on, has, has that very powerful thing in it that the, to put it very simply, you know, the Sufis are right and the Mullahs are wrong and, you know, by extension the whole um, the power hierarchy and everything is to be, to be rejected in favour of the higher truth. So, whether or not, I mean, Willis Shah certainly comes across very he has a very, well, his huge appeal is that very powerful voice. He's very outspoken and, um, you know, gives very short shrift to people who don't measure up to his um, quite austere vision, in a way, of, of, what is, of what is right. So, it's partly a question of the tradition, the whole tradition that, you know, a Sufi poet, right from... You know, you go way back to the very early Sufis to um, to uh, Mansur, to Allah, who in the you know, the tenth century in Baghdad, you know, was, was executed by by the powers that be, and for his um, notorious saying, "I'm the divine truth," um, which is. Uh, you know, so he, you could say that he was, you know, a very outspoken, heretical view that um, he wasn't afraid to express. So the people, later people, always, you know, could go back to him, and um, he's endlessly kind of invoked by the later poets as an example and a model, and. Um, that's a beautiful thing in another great poet I shouldn't probably be talking about today, but he's always in my mind, who is Shah Abdel Latif, the great Sindhi poet, who in many ways I think is perhaps the greatest of all the Sufi poets of Pakistan. And whereas Pulya Shah and some extent Kasha Fari, who they say, I'm a follower, I, I, 
I'm a Mansoor, a follower of Mansoor, and I speak my mind, and I, um, I too say Amal um, Haq. But he, Shah Latif, it's all kind of veiled and referred to, this very powerful sense of divine omnipresence is there, but he doesn't need to kind of wrap it out. I think they're very different. That's just what I was saying, rather than being <coughs> Bulla Shah and, and Khaja Farid, you know, being very different kinds of personalities and very different sorts of you know, different periods of history, of course, too. Mm. Different kinds of personalities, but I guess as is common in the uh, Sufi poetry from the region, both invoke the great love stories of the region. So Khaja talks a lot to Sasi um, Bunna and Bola Bulla Shah, so he talks a lot to the Hijranja. Uh, what can you tell us about kind of how those stories are used in a spiritual context in their writings? Well, they have, you know, they, they form in a way the heart of the, the poetry, the references to the, the great um, romantic legends of the region, and um, <coughs> the way in which they, you know, the, the figures, the leading figures of it are used to embody the whole. Um, like, you know, when, when he says, you know, Ramja Ramja Abhima Ape Ramja Hui. So it's the, how the, the heroines of the legend, who are the, if you like, the symbols or the, of the, the divine being who is, you know, the, the prime manifestation of the divine, who is the hero. And so, Maranja is you know, completely invested with the in Bulesha, with the attributes of them. And it's in a way that the if you read, you know, an alternative account, the most famous one is the Balesha, mm -hmm. one's contemporary with, with Bulesha. He's actually a kind of old trickster and uh, he's kind of a bit of a rascal. I mean it's, it's a very different sort of take. So Khaja Farid, Sassi was the great figure. Mm -hmm. And although he wrote about Bulishan, I mean he wrote as Bulishan did about he as well. With many of his finest lyrics are devoted to Sassi. And um, he said somewhere, people were asking him about what kind of countryside he liked and everything. He said, well, actually, I like the, you know, the desert, my favorite, because you know, we in Bartholomew, we live in the desert. So Sassi has a particular resonance for people. Um, yeah. Mm. We, um, the thought I had, so those, some of those themes, like <coughs> sissy, devotion, love, um, for me, as such a kind of the Sikh tradition, there, there are the parallels I see between the writings of Bulle and um, the kind of panic new Bhakti tradition. Yes. So, what, 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 I mean, would you have some thoughts on that? Yes, there are very much, and, you know, the, because they too, you know, the Bhakti poets, again had a, um, a rather different but not completely dissimilar sort of combination of um, <coughs> strongly emphasizing you know divine eminence, the uselessness of ritual <coughs> or organized religion. So that sort of protest side is the same and that um, you know, sense of the you know, higher values um, was certainly to some extent in common. Although one must never forget, I think, that the, the Sufis were, you know, profoundly anchored to Islam in a way that the um, Bhakti Post didn't have that sort of thing. So that is. Um, but it does make it different, and it's, you know, one, one difference that emerges is the way in which the, you know, the Sufi poets are all, although they kind of make a wonderful use of co common sort of popular idiom and phraseology and everything, but they're also all endless bits of Arabic um, put in as well, you know, quotations of little Arabic tags of verses from the Quran and things, <coughs> things that cause a huge problem to the Sikh editors of in the Wookiee script of Bullish. Of course. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um,
we uh, could we talk a little to you? Um, so, brother Mulisha has been with Shah and I, but we know Khwajaji's been with his brother. Yes. What can we deduce about the idea of being really deep from, from their writings, kind of the concept? What about the idea of being or being what he did, kind of yes. Like that. Yes. Um, well, it's really totally essential. It is, you know, that's how the that's how the teaching is transmitted. And the the, the um, Willisha is always talking. I'm the most person he talks most about in his poetry is his being, Chinese, mm. and. You know, he makes a lot of the fact that disparity in, in their social status, that Polish was a Soviet and um, China was an Iranian, yeah. and people kind of mocked him for that, and other sides did. So, gosh, believe, by contrast, you know, his father, well, he came from a hereditary dynasty of, um, of bees, but his father died when he was quite young, so his elder brother took him over. and. Um, there are great, you know, he, he again, he pays in his poetry lots of, you know, passionate, expresses his devotion and profound debt to his brother and in the, um, in his teachings too, and there are various anecdotes about the importance of the peer to him. So, yes, the peer figure is really all important to both of them. Could we, Professor, do delve into perhaps some of the teachings and uh, if you could perhaps even pick one that gives us a flavor or a glimpse of the, of the personality of Clarence? <laughs> Just while you've been talking to me, and I see as it comes up on the next page, there's a, there's a lot of stories here about the peers of the past, and um, the anecdotes from the section literature of Islam and then there are and also you know peculiar teachings about what happens if you if you leave your peer on a Wednesday <coughs> which he brings all sorts of terrible consequences <laughs> um, yes and he continued with another anecdote a disciple asked her to put down to leave the part on a Wednesday don't go today, he said, because it's forbidden to take leave upon Sheikh on a Wednesday. But he insisted on going so pathetically, offering all sorts of reasons, that he was finally granted permission to depart, and off he went. On the way, he happened to fall into the hands of Robert, who ripped off his clothes and beat him up. Yeah. Naked and weeping, he returned to the Sheikh and told him what had happened on the way. My dear fellow, said the saint, didn't I tell you not to go today? In spite of this, he wouldn't stay, and off he went. What you have experienced is all part of the unluckiness and inauspiciousness of a Wednesday. <laughs> self in order to get rid of the mistaken idea that Wednesday has no power to harm people, for it derives its power from Almighty God and it is this delegated authority that its inauspiciousness is to be attributed. So there's a lot of stories here, but um, you know, a lot of the anecdotes relate to the authority and the absolute authority which in Khashoggi's case was reinforced by his closeness to the temporal authority mm. of the ruling, the, the, the prince of the state. Um, yes, there's many other, many other bad things happen to people who leave on a Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, open up uh, for questions, and uh, uh, if that's okay. Is there a mic uh, kind of wandering? Where's the mic?
speak out, but it doesn't work. It does work? Okay. Um, Pastor Shaku, um, I was wondering, I, I was on this last point. So I work on the translations, um, I, I translate the words Satan Malu from Mion and uh, myself. And I was looking at um, the place of tradition in that, uh, in that word, because it's quite spelled out. Like, you know, there's a whole genealogy of the previous um, Sufi peers that in South Central Malouk has uh, mentioned. So I, I'm quite interested in this aspect of tradition as it's spelled out. But then I, but I'm curious about the Bhakti word, like, you know, sort of the Bhakti tradition seems to be, so one, one word which stands out of this tradition quite uh, subconsciously seems to be Baba Nana. So he doesn't really spell out um, a genealogy and does something new and different. Would you agree with that? Or is that a tradition which is you know, broken out by Baba Nana? You know, I, think, uh, I think that is, that is a, very, a very true point because the Bhakti poets on the whole, they were, they were one-offs. They kept reinventing. In Islam, everything has been invented already, you know, from the very start. So that the, um, uh, the Sufi genealogies, in, in a way, just reinforce that. Whereas people like Guru Nanak or indeed Kabir, before him, so people have come up with theories that, you know, Nanak was the disciple of Kabir and so forth to try and put them into some sort of order, but it clearly wasn't. And, um, you know, he, he was quite different. And um, so it's, it's much more, much less tidy. It's like, you know, Bhakti, as I said, was a process of continual reinvention, I think. Whereas the Sufis had their position. It, that's <coughs> in part, I think, a reflection of the, the social and political realities of pre modern India, you know, which was dominated by Muslim institutions. <laughs> And I wonder whether you can take other as, as meaning tradition in, in that sense, perhaps, is it? Professor Shackle, um, a former student of yours, uh, Sadhya, uh, thank you very much for speaking. Uh, I have a question about uh, any any detectable influence uh, from Nasir Sirhindi, who also wrote in Persian on Sasipuru and a couple of other local traditions that may have filtered either or emanated from Lahore as a center, uh, or uh, do you find that there's no connection? The connection in what sense? Like the, the development of themes, maybe, the, maybe an overlap in the treatment of both narrative and also Sufi concepts. Yes. Um, sorry. There is, um, you know, there's this huge pool of stuff lying about to which people dipped their hands in variously, I think, and the, the elite poets, or people you know, writing in Persian, and things did that, and the, the first, you know, Hiranjab, who is the kind of archetypal Punjabi story, the oldest versions are in Persian, not in Punjabi. And um, so for them it was, you know, a continual resource. And for the popular poets, writing in the, in, in local languages and so forth, that was another way of doing it. I don't think really that the, the interaction between them was that considerable, as far as I know, that they were two, you know, they were two groups of people working rather in, in rather different ways. So I, I wouldn't have thought, I wouldn't look for influences too much. Although people spend a lot of time, typically on the most boring kinds of research, which is the, um, you know, how a particular story is handled with a particular twist in one version and not in another and drawing those lines out the three genius work, I think, but still. I'm afraid I do exactly that. Me <laughs> 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 too. Uh, Professor, you, you, uh, you mentioned at the beginning of your talk this uh, universal central concept of Sufism, which is Gaitatul Wujud. 
that we find from Rumi to Sufi Sarmad and all the way down to Baba Zahid In your experience in readings, are there one or two um, exponents of this tradition who jump out at you in terms of the, the novelty of their approach towards uh, this fantastic expression? I think that the, you know, if one's looking at it from a comparative broad perspective tradition, it would be very difficult not to allow one's heart and mind to be dazzled by Rumi. I think who is the supreme genius yeah. of he was absolutely fantastic. And I think it helped the fact that he had a profound training, of course, in Islamic sciences from other people. So he really knew his stuff, apart from being a wonderful, wonderful writer. I think within the um, you know, within the, the kind of South Asian context, the um, the person who who stands out, one of the people who stands out for me is um, Khaja Dizanuddin Goliath Delhi, because he's so, he has a beautiful Malvazat written about him. Um, so we, Which you translated? I did, well, I did a sort of, I helped a bit with the translation. I, I, I tried to tidy up some of the um, some of the Persian verses in it to make them sound a bit more like poetry, but I was not. Sorry, but just a, a quick question of clarity. So did you say Amir Khosrow's uh, poetry for Khazir Azamuddin only or Khazir Azamuddin's own poetry? I think, no, the poetry is by, it was written by... By, by Khosrow, right? No, by his um, Amir Hassan Sisi, right. who was another disciple right. there. And like, he was a poet like Amir Khosrow, although rather less famous, but a very, very talented and beautiful poet. And so. Uh, and he wrote the love result. Later on, I think, you know, in some ways, the, I mean, both the two poets we've been talking about today <coughs> and the one whom I mentioned were Shah Abdel who is quite, quite lovely poet. I, it was something that I, um, I pushed myself to try and learn Sindhi better in order to, in order to translate him, and it was, it was hugely rewarding. It's absolutely wonderful. And it's a great shame, I think, that, um, you know, because, you know, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, and so forth, they're all kind of, in poetry at least, much of a, you know, they, you can, if you know one, you can kind of get on with the others, too. Whereas Sindhi is really difficult, because <laughs> it's sort of separate on its own. But those are really my, <coughs> my own truths, I think. Um, but no, there are many, you know, once I've started on this, there are so many others that come to mind. And I think in um, somebody whom I had hoped to work on, if, had my life been a bit longer, it seems to be ending a bit quickly, was um, the great Persian poet, um, Abu Qadr of the, um, uh, you know, 18th century. He was absolutely magnificent by it, and with wonderful, wonderful <coughs> insights. Um, I know one time I had an idea that I would, when I was first in Pakistan, really, I would um, go and pick up a, a copy of the Kuliyat from Kabul song, which I'd put it off and put it off, and then, of course, you know, everything went wrong. You can't sort of move countries so easily down there, so I never did. Um, but he, he is a most devastatingly um, brilliant poet. I mean, I like, the thing about Sufi poetry is there's something for everybody. And if you're an academic, you know, with that sort of background, then there are lots of much cleverer poets to learn from there. And if you're a simple soul, then, which we all, you know, we've all got a bit of both in us, then there's plenty of that too. And the thing is that it never runs out. It goes, I'm, now that I'm, I'm 76 now, and the feeling that the springs will never run dry. It's always going to be there. And there's always probably going to be some other person that I have never read before, I've never encountered at first hand, who am I going to enjoy enormously and learn from. So I'm very, very lucky to have found it. When I, who would have thought that when I, you know, enrolled the 
the degree in Persian in Oxford in the early 1960s. <coughs> I wind up doing this for a living. I mean, it's just so lucky. <laughs> so lucky. <coughs> Hi, oh, Professor Tackle. I hope you live for another hundred years. Actually, your, your writings and uh, your sessions are absolutely inspiring. Um, so, I've got a question. In, in their lives, both Bolisha and um, Fareed, were they followed by um, all religions, people from all backgrounds? So what was their following? Was it was it mostly from the Islamic um, culture or, 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 or well, all cultures? Well, Fareed was very much a um, you know, he lived in a kind of Muslim, very much a Muslim society. Um, in his Malfat art, he has some extremely harsh words to say, as you might expect about Hindus, but about <coughs> Shias. Um, so that's, you know, the universal <laughs> understanding is perhaps not always so universal as you think. Bulisha is somebody, because the historical record is so patchy, that you can make up, we can each have our own Bulisha. Mm -hmm. And the people who perhaps you know, seized on that most successfully were Sikhs. Mm -hmm. Because when they, um, there's a sort of gap in the, in the Sikh tradition, I know after the Gurus and the Khansa <coughs> and things, that needed to be, needed to be filled by other people. And Bulisha was a wonderful person to do. And this is why the, the translation that I did for the Murti Library of Bulisha <coughs> is done, it's printed in Gurmukhi script. Um, because that was the, the commercial decision that Harvard University Press rightly took um, that they sell more copies that way. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, you know. <laughs> I could persuade them to do an Urdu script one as well, but this never happened. Any final questions? Uh, if I may ask another one. Um, would you imagine, on the same stream of thought as the last question, would you imagine some of the Punjabi poets that you encountered as more like public intellectuals or more like public educators? You know, sort of, are they, because they're speaking the idiom and the themes of the common man, are they more like, are they less like our English poets who remain somewhat of an elitist endeavor? I think it kind of varies into the theme, you know, because that, as well, the Sufi poetry is only one, you know, one part of the Punjabi poetic tradition. And of course there were, you know, equally there were many kind of mullahs writing Punjabi poetry, um, teaching, you know, different things of the uh, Sharia and the rules and things. It's very, very, it's quite hard work, you know, to, to read. Um, so there's a big, you know, a big range of, of things, but by definition, the, I, I suppose, you know, I'm exposed, conditioned by my own training, that I tend to, you know, I enjoy reading books more than I enjoy reading, you know, listening to tapes of illiterate poets. You know, so that I'm, I'm prejudiced in that way, so that the common, the sort of totally common touch um, rather eludes me. It doesn't sort of, doesn't, I would be dishonest, really, if I, if I pretended that I could. But I don't think, I'm trying to think of, you know, actual, I don't think there's anything in, in Punjabi, let's say, quite like, um, Allama Iqbal, who seems to be the, you know, although he does have, you know, obviously knew a lot about Sufism and things, but that sort of public intellectual manner that um, comes across so strongly for him, which I'm not actually, I have to say, terribly sympathetic to. Um, perhaps, Mir Muhammad Bush, who everybody in the, you know, if you go to the you know, Mirpur and the Potoir and things, and meet people from that region, they seem to have an immense store of verses which they wrap out in that very forceful manner, which is... Well, I grew up in Bradford, surrounded by Mirpur, so... <laughs> 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 Do you remember any? Um, I have a very poor, I've 
learn too much, you'll be able to remember it, I think. Um, I can only remember little, kind of, little fragments, I'm afraid. Okay, um, can we do a warm show of appreciation? I think we have something very special for you now, so I'm going to pass on to you uh, uh, for a special performance.
ਸ਼ਾਮ ਮੁਹੰਮਦ ਘਰ ਜਾਂਦੀ 